Hello everyone. So in the past we have chatted about the aggregate that is inequality. I think the, the video is up there, okay, if I've got that right. And that was a lot of fun. Gulnara took us through that. Now the reason we chatted about that is because it's something that people care about, people like reported. But to understand why we would talk about something like inequality and something like GDP, we need a way of tying all these principles together. Gawley is going to take us through a specific metaphor that economists use to understand how those things tie together called Oaken's Leaky Bucket. Over to you, Gawley. Thank you, Matt. The idea of a leaky bucket metaphor comes from Arthur Oaken's 1975 book called Equality and Efficiency, The Big Trade-Off. However, in our story, Oaken is the owner of a well and he has some water. So let's go. From this well, Oaken is endowed with water, which allows him to live, allows him to grow excess food, which he can sell for other goods and services, and allows him to clean himself. So lots of benefits are involved with having this water. And since Oaken has the property right over the water, he is able to do with it as he wishes. At the same time, there is another person. Let's call him Matt. Matt has no water and he's out in the sun where it's very hot. Maybe he's trying to get fit and so is exhausted from running. Or maybe he has been living in a place where there is now a drought. In both cases, we have the same issue. Matt has no access to water and would really like to have it. Perhaps Okun and Matt could trade, but in this instance they cannot. Why? Because Matt doesn't have any endowed resources to trade with Okun. Because of Matt's limited endowment, he has no access to water and so is likely to suffer greatly due to this. Now, our friend Big Bucket comes over. Big Bucket is able to take a water off Okun and deliver water to Matt. However, Big Bucket has some leaks, and so as the water is taken and transferred to Matt, some of the water which is taken away from Okun will be purely wasted. We are in charge of the bucket and so need to determine how much we will fill it up and whether we redistribute any water to Matt. The question is, how much of a leakage we are, are we willing to accept in order to take a full bucket of water away from Okun to provide a leaked amount to Matt? In other words, how much water are we willing to waste in order to help the thirsty person? The differences in available water for Okun and Matt is inequality in water. By transferring water away from Okun, we lower this inequality, and by transferring it to Matt, we also lower this inequality. As a result, the desire to redistribute in this way is a preference for equality in water. This trades off against the preference for water as if there is waste in water as it is redistributed, there is less water overall. As a result, the greater the leakage we are willing to accept, the stronger the preference for equality is relative to the preference for the quantity of water. The leakage idea is useful for figuring out what our relative preference for equality is. But it also leads us to think about the ways that leakage could be reduced. If leakage can be reduced, then more water can be allocated to Matt for the same sacrifice by Okun. Win-win. So what are leaks? Leaks can be split into two categories, administrative costs and changes in behavior that reduce the overall quantity of water. In this example, administrative costs refer directly to a loss associated with taking an existing bucket load of water when it's moved from Okun's hands to Matt's hands. The behavioral costs refer to a potential decision by Okun to pull up less water from the well and a decision by Matt to do less to get water for himself. 
Plugging leaks in this case can refer to reducing administrative costs or a reduction in behavioral change. Now, the reason for the asterisk next to behavior here uh, is because this is an area where water can be misleading, as even if the amount of water did rise, this would only come from Okun and or Matt deciding to spend more of their scarce leisure time. This behavioral distortion is still a cost in terms of the net well-being of our two friends here even though the total amount of water may be the same or higher. We can understand this behavioral issue and any social preference for equality or inequality by thinking more carefully about the leakage that Big Bucket, as our representative in this example, is, is okay with when transferring water. Here Big Bucket is making a transfer on the basis of some principles the most common of these are ability to contribute, equal sacrifice, and natural rights. These tell us that we expect people to contribute on the basis of what they have available, that the amount people sacrifice should be based on experiencing the same well-being cost, and that individuals have a natural right over the income they generate. Furthermore, people have a right to a minimum living standard that allows them to participate in social life. To think about redistributive preferences in this regard, people will want to think along two margins. The initial outcomes prior to redistribution and the behavior and opportunities involved for both Okun and Matt. The first initial outcome is the amount of water in the well. If there was infinite water, we may be more comfortable to redistribute than if there was only enough water in the well for Okun's donkey, as shown in this image. The second initial outcome is the amount of water Matt is holding. If Matt actually has a bottle of water in his hand, redistribution would feel a lot less necessary than if he didn't have any water. In terms of behavior and opportunities, we start asking how the observed amount of water came about. Did Okun work very, very hard to get the water? Did Matt have easy access to water he didn't bother getting hold of? This matters not just because we might believe that people should be rewarded on effort, but because someone's willingness to sacrifice leisure time to get a hold of the water tells us how much they value the water. So how would we think about it here? If Matt doesn't have access to water and didn't have the opportunity to get it, we would quite like to redistribute water to him. If Okun had to work hard getting water up and was only able uh, to pull up a small amount of water, we would feel a bit bad redistributing away from him. So, how do we use this metaphor to think about trade-offs in general? For this, I'm going to pass over to Matty. However, his desire for water hopefully won't stop him from being objective when discussing this. Excellent. Thank you, Goli. And I think that was a really clear description of how we would think about the metaphor and use it. But one thing I want to do since we have a bit of extra time was ask about how we might apply this to actual GDP and inequality numbers we see, because this is what will happen with the literature, and this is what happens when you see journalists go and write things up for you. So we might start off by saying this is a GDP inequality trade-off. Now, why would we think about it on these lines? Well, GDP is the amount of production that occurs. Inequality is how that production is then allocated between people. The production is the income that we have available to consume, the things we have. And so when we talk about a dispersion in income, and we talk about a level of income, we're very much talking about GDP and inequality. Now, in this context, how could we think about this happening? You could have a situation where someone has a desire to produce something because they will receive a reward, an amount of income, but since some of that is being taken off them, they decide not to make those things. 
because of that production is lower, because we are redistributing to generate lower inequality in the outcomes. So that seems like a really clear trade-off. And when people talk about the big trade-off, that is the sort of idea they have. But both in the book and in reality, when we turn around and talk about these things, this is a bit oversimplistic. The first thing is there can be a distinction between the short and long term. So when we're looking at this, you can have a situation where, hey, the changes in behavior take time to occur. It takes time for people to retrain to do different roles. New generations will decide to pick up different skills because of the rewards available to them. So the trade-off can be quite long-term rather than short-term. But it goes a lot more deeply than that. The GDP inequality trade-off in itself doesn't necessarily ring true. A lot of more recent studies comparing different countries that have higher inequality find that they have lower GDP as a result. Now, how might this work? If you're in a society you perceive as unfair, you might just work less hard. If inequality is lower, you might perceive the society as fairer and so be willing to do more. There's no clear, easy answer for talking about this, and each time we required a mechanism, we required behavior and a way for it to work out. GDP and inequality are aggregates, and they only bear a loose relationship to what we care about, which fundamentally is well-being. Now, why am I being all pedantic and saying, let's not focus on this GDP inequality trade-off in isolation? Let's not ignore it because it can be symptomatic of things, but let's not make it the only thing or the target per se. Well, if you want to see a detailed discussion, you can jump over to this beautiful blog post, but we're going to chat through it here. Higher GDP and lower income inequality could well involve lower well-being. Now, this seems wild when you first hear it, but give me a second. What happens if we take everyone who's in the bottom third of the income distribution? We chain them up in a factory and we make them produce, but then we go and we pay them based on what they're producing. Their incomes will go up since they're having to sit there and work, but we also have a situation where GDP goes up. Now, since it's their incomes going up that's generating it, inequality does fall. So higher GDP, lower income inequality. But did we just hear what I said? We are chaining people up, taking them away from their families, not allowing them to have leisure time. They have no choice to do this. And that sort of situation, we would not view that as welfare enhancing, as increasing well-being. These people are essentially acting as slaves. In this way, we want to think more deeply about what we mean by behavioral change and specifically the options people have available. When we're talking about what happens here, we're not saying GDP and inequality measures can give us the full story. We're saying that we believe that when there's some change in people's behavior, that change in behavior represents their desire, their willingness to take something on and how they value it. Now, economists will say they can correct for this in GDP and inequality measures by putting in hours of work. That would deal with the issue we chatted about just before. But it goes to more than that. Do people actually have the opportunity to make choices? Do people have the capability to go around and make these choices? And is there any way of making sure that people have those opportunities and people are capable of living a good life due to what is available in society? In this way, we would want to judge by the opportunities people have available and recognize that what they choose to do given those opportunities is something that they would likely prefer. Now, there could be reasons why they pick the wrong thing. They could be facing a behavioral bias. They could be overloaded with choices. And when we think about setting up the opportunities available to people, the institutions that are there to that set those, we'll want to take that into account. But still allowing people to make that choice, people to trade off income against spending time with their families and community is a good thing. And so making sure we can think more fully about the opportunities available to people and how people from different situations can end up being able to live a good life and being able to choose to do something is important. When we complain about inequality, we're often worried about the fact that some people have opportunities that others don't. And that's not shown in the inequality measures we build per se. So we want to be careful when we do that. Now actually determining these things is not the job of an economist. It's the job of a moral philosopher. An economist can describe, 
the set of opportunities available to a person, but then that person has some right to make their own choices, and a moral philosopher can tell us where there might be certain issues that appear. But it gives us a good way of starting. Specifically, the goal here is to create a framework that we can use to have constructive discussions and recognize where our actual preferences about well-being differ. Everyone does have different preferences and ways that people can represent those and represent what they think is just as important. I thank you for listening to us today and we hope to catch you again next time. Bye bye.